And thank you very much, first of all, uh, Pavel and Guntram for inviting me for this uh, meeting. And indeed, I mean, we are going to switch back to infectious disease and try to see how life science can help us mitigating the pandemic risk in a world changing when it comes to climate and environment. I'm sorry for those of you who were here yesterday. I mean, I have a few slides shared between the teaser of yesterday and today, but because they are newcomers, I will go over them again. A bit of repetition doesn't hurt anyway. Um, just to start by saying that we are all aware how the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us how devastating pandemic can be. When you have a highly transmissible virus like respiratory root or those, a significant lethality, I mean, close to 1% for SARS-CoV-2. And when the traditional method of control do not work, which happens when you have a virus that can be transmitted bef before onset of symptoms, and isolation of cases and quarantine of contacts will no longer work in those circumstances. Then you end up with a pandemic with an estimated more than 20 million people who have died by mid 2022. Uh, with people suffering from sequela from intensive care unit, there were about as many people going to intensive care unit as people dying in France, for instance. People suffering from long COVID. Uh, we have recently learned that 4% uh, of the French population were suffering from long COVID at the end of 2022. Impact on the mental health of population because of all the restrictions and on children education because of school closure. Um, there has been an estimate that uh, the children in high-income countries have lost the equivalent of a trimester of school year, and in middle-income countries it would go to two trimesters. And economically, the epidemic also has been devastating, as you know. The IMF has estimated that there was lost output of 12,500 billion for the world, and for France alone, it's estimated that 300 billion euros which were lost during the pandemic. The bad news is that what we have witnessed uh, during the past uh, decades is an acceleration of emergence. Um, on this slide, you can see that in the 40 years prior to the year 2000, there had been five noteworthy emergence, including AIDS, as you all know, had been so devastating. But since 2000, there have already been 10 significant emergence, among which SARS, H1N1 flu in 2009, and Zika, Ebola, COVID-19. That can be in part attributed to the increase in the density of the population, increase in the mobility of the population. But what is also very important is the contact rate between animals and humans, because most of those um, new emerging disease are animal viruses that are jumping to humans. And on this, uh, scheme, you can see basically that you would have viruses living in animal reservoirs. They can be bats, they can be rodents, they can be migratory or aquatic birds, jumping to humans, sometimes through what we call an intermediate host, which may eventually be living closer to humans. And uh, sometimes also mosquitoes will uh, give some help to, to this transition to humans. Just to give you a few examples, I mean, Ebola, for instance, it would be a fruit bat probably, that uh, would go to humans through, among others, non-human primates. Uh, if I think of SARS in 2003, this time it was a different type of bat, a rhinophilus bat, that would infect civet cats, and eventually the virus would jump to humans. If you think of influenza, many come from uh, birds, migratory aquatic birds, infecting poultry, pigs, who may work as mixing vessels, generating new influenza viruses that eventually would come to humans. So you have all this chain of events, and, and therefore you realize how important it is that we monitor this interface between animals and humans. And in this regard, it would be interesting to uh, wonder what science is telling us about how climate change and environmental change are going to affect this rate of contact between animals and humans. The, here is a complex slide, I give you the paper just for reference for those of you who would want to dig a little bit further, uh, of a group which has tried to look at how climatic hazards through different mechanisms of increase in temperature, flood, precipitations, and other hazard risk would link to different modes of transmission of pathogens, 
uh, vector-borne, um, uh, food-borne, I mean, the airborne pathogens and all sorts of modes of transmission, and how that would translate into different types of disease according to whether you're talking about viruses, bacteria, um, and, and protozoans, for instance. Um, again, I'm not going to detail it, but here is a sort of... Uh, quite exhaustive work done to, to try to see and anticipate and, and quantify, as you can see with the width of the arrows between the different groups, uh, the risk of transition of different type of um, pathogens to humans based on these climatic hazards. Another approach has been to try to see um, how climate and land use change is going to increase this contact rate between animals and humans that I was referring to earlier. Uh, the work here is uh, looking at the geography of animals and the phylogenetic distance that exists between animals and humans that would make them more likely to share viruses if they were in contact. And based on that, and um, guessing that uh, with the rise in temperature, uh, animals will have to move to more uh, high elevation areas that would be more suitable for them. And that with land use change, we talk mainly about deforestation, uh, you would have an increase in the concentration of wild animals in the remaining forest, as well as if you put some agricultural land inside the forest, you are going to create an interface between the edge of the forest and the agricultural land where wild animals will come in contact with domesticated animals, then you can have exchanges of virus. I mean, with all those hypotheses, I mean, the, these researchers have projected that by 2070, under different climatic scenario, here I'm showing the one of the Paris Agreement, you would have had, by that time, about twice more encounters among animal species as already exist today. And that will result in more than 15,000 viruses that will move to a new animal species and eventually induce a zoonotic spillover event or eventually also a transmission to humans. This will take place in high elevation areas, in uh, species-rich ecosystems, mainly in Africa and in Asia. Sorry, yeah. Mainly in Africa and in, in Asia. And, um, and therefore, it's one way to try to quantify how much of this uh, climate and land use change can impact. In this hypothesis, we are talking about no dispersal limits so that animals can move quite freely. In uh, another uh, scenario, they consider that the terrestrial mammals would not be able to move as easily, whereas the flying mammals, like bats, can move easily. In that scenario, uh, you would see that it's mainly in Southeast Asia and with bats that this risk of viral sharing would take place and bats would take, well, would account for about 90% of all the new encounters in, in, in that scenario where animals would be limited in their ways of moving uh, over the years. The, uh, the case study that the authors chose was the Ebola virus. We know already of about 13 um, animal hosts for the Ebola virus. And they tried to see uh, how these animals would distribute over the earth uh, under this climate change scenario. That's what you can see uh, on, the right, on the left, sorry. At the middle, you see how it's going to enrich some areas of Africa, and particularly eastern part of Africa, in animal species that could transmit Ebola. And to the right, you see how it will create first new encounters with animal species that currently do not host Ebola. And they predict that there will be 100 new animal species that would be eventually harboring Ebola virus under this scenario, showing the potential again for the spread of this uh, dramatic epidemic, as you know. Biodiversity is going to decline. There are different scenarios, uh, and here is one showing you how uh, increase in temperature will affect uh, not only the total number of species, uh, whether we're talking about plants or vertebrates, but also the area suitable for the different species. Um, what was interesting is that work on land use and biodiversity uh, has been maybe a little bit less elaborated. And, and this paper, is telling us that um, change in land use, and we are moving from primary vegetation to the left to urbanized uh, land to, to the right, 
is going to affect biodiversity uh, for animals, particularly for those who do not host pathogen. Um, however, the animals that all host pathogens that can be transmissible to humans are more likely to increase in numbers, uh, whether we are talking about the number of species or whether we are talking about the number of hosts within one species. Um, this is it's not really clear how it's going to work. I mean, one of the uh, animals they are considering particularly are the small mammals, like rodents, and the popular theory would be that those small mammals are short-lived and they spend a lot of energy uh, for their reproductive life. And as a result, they have less energy to fight pathogens. And therefore, they are becoming more tolerant to pathogens. So this is one of the theory that would explain this shift, uh, where you would see more and more uh, uh, hosts of pathogens uh, able to live near humans in urbanized areas, for instance. And whereas those uh, species that do not host pathogens would decline. And they stratify the analysis for birds, bats, rodents, and primates um, to, to illustrate the point that I was just uh, making. I have been looking at this literature, which is a bit new for me. I have to uh, make a disclaimer like uh, I think Andy did at the beginning of his talk, you know, and um, I find it fascinating on one hand. At the same time, I find they treat a little bit equally all a different type of host species, whereas we know that when it comes to bats, for instance, uh, the enemies have been pretty well identified. If I talk about uh, viruses like um, Ebola, Marburg, Hendra, Nipah, I mean, fruit bats are the uh, animal species that are hosting those uh, viruses. If we look at beta coronaviruses, which have been responsible for SARS, MERS, and COVID-19, it's a rhinophilus bat. And in this regard, I really like this kind of work that was performed at a very small scale by the team of Rena Plowright in Australia, where they looked at one of these well-identified uh, suspects, which is the fruit bat, its relationship with horses and humans in the transmission of the Hendra virus. And it's 25 years of work in a few kilometers square area, where they were able to show that in the process of forest clearing, uh, the fruit bats, uh, which feed on nectar in forest, had to move outside during winter times, which in Australia is between June and September, to agriculture and urban areas. And there they eventually get into contact in the agricultural areas with the horses, transmit the virus to the horses, which would transmit it to humans. So they could document um, here, you can see during the month of June to August, uh, the spillovers to, to horses, more frequent in recent time, and more likely to occur in the area where you have the, uh, the agricultural area where the horses are, are staying. Um, when it comes to mosquitoes, a uh, similar type of work has been done, has already been alluded to by Andy, where uh, we have, for instance, for major viruses like yellow fever, dengue, Zika, and chikungunya that we call arboviruses, two main mosquito species transmitting them, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Aedes aegypti in tropical countries, Aedes albopictus in temperate zones. And there are different scenarios that show that with the increase in temperature, more areas would become suitable for those mosquitoes. And the number of months during which transmission will take place every year will also increase. And Andy, as Andy was also saying, I mean, at higher temperature, the cycle of the virus inside the mosquito decreases and the mosquito becomes more competent. So all that together is suggesting that those viruses are likely to uh, become more prominent, to reappear in some areas of the world from which they had disappeared. And uh, not only the circulation of the viruses in tropical countries would be year-long in many places, but in temperate zones like Europe and, and the US, you will have uh, areas colonized by Aedes albopictus, but also Aedes aegypti coming back, uh, where transmission could be substantial during a substantial number of months per year. Um, and just as an example of something that also Andy covered during his talk, uh, there are some relationships that have been established between the El Nino Southern Oscillations in the uh, Pacific near the Lat Latin America, 
and the repercussions uh, of warmer temperature in northern part of Bangladesh six months later, increasing the temperature of water four to six months later, and therefore a lag time of 11 months between those oscillations and the peaks of cholera. And as you can see on this graph, you can use this to predict pretty well uh, the cholera peaks of Bangladesh based on the El Nino oscillations um, 11 months earlier once you have corrected for, for the time lag. The probably warmer temperature will facilitate the, the growth of the Vibrio cholerae and that would be the way it works. Uh, cholera would be indeed among the bacteria that one of the few I'm going to talk about today, the one that has been responsible for the larger epidemics uh, during the past decades. Now, um, what are the main threats and what should be done to mitigate the risk if we want to be a little bit more uh, targeted in our approach? Um, I can't help thinking that beta coronavirus, we have had already three emergence in, since the beginning of the 21st century with SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 are major threats. We know pretty well now uh, that these viruses are hosted by renal follicles bat and uh, places in uh, Asia where you find them. And recently there was some work showing that the closest virus to SARS-CoV-2 has been found in bats of uh, Laos. Um, but also you have these intermediate hosts, which are animals uh, like uh, civet cats, ferrets, uh, raccoon dogs, um, the um, uh, minks, for instance, uh, small carnivorous animals about the size of cats that are sold in markets in Asia and that play the role of intermediate hosts between the bats and humans. And that's where uh, I think the action to try to mitigate the risk of pandemics is twofold fighting deforestation because clearly there are some links in the way the bats move and the uh, forestal area where they are, and the control of markets um, where those animals, intermediate hosts, are sold because this is probably the place of emergence for, for these new future beta coronaviruses. Likewise, another big threat has to do with influenza viruses. I mean, we have had three major pandemics in the 20th century. We already had one in 2009. We currently are uh, watching very closely H5N1, which has become very active in the avian fauna during the past two years. There are reassortments of those uh, segments of the genome of the influenza virus that give birth to new uh, viruses, and that can take place in the avian world, but also among pigs. Um, and, and this is the reason why I think we need to have this very close surveillance uh, of birds and animal farming. Uh, with a debated discussion about whether vaccination of those animals uh, is helpful or not in trying to mitigate the risk of transmission to, to humans. Um, the economics of what I was just describing regarding those major threats associated with respiratory viruses that are uh, beta coronaviruses and influenza viruses has been estimated in a paper published in Science about three years ago. If you work on reducing deforestation by half, and action to try to um, do better surveillance of wildlife market um, and uh, animal farming with substitution for the people that live on it, uh, you get to a cost um, of about 22 or $25 billion uh, a year, which is about equivalent to the benefit you would be doing in terms of the um, uh, carbon uh, benefits saved out of the reduction of deforestation. So it, let's say, is about on the same scale and balances out. And it's by no means comparable with the cost of pandemics like COVID-19, because here we are about 500 to 1,000 times uh, more um, loss associated with a pandemic of that scale. When it comes to mosquitoes, I would like to say a few words about the technique of uh, infecting mosquitoes with a bacteria called Volbachia, uh, which has given some quite promising results. It acts in different ways. The um, mosquitoes like Aedes that would be infected with Volbachia would become resistant to the arboviruses I was mentioning earlier. But also, it would give a reproductive advantage to the females infected with the Volbachia bacteria. Um, to the point that a female infected with Volbacta bacteria, whether she mates with an infected or uninfected male, will have an offspring infected with Volbachia and resistant to pathogens. But a female which is uninfected, if she mates with a male which is infected, 
and they won't have any offspring because of cytoplasmic incompatibility between the egg and the sperm. And therefore, you have this reproductive advantage, which means that you will have a population replacement after release of infected mosquitoes in the population. And those uh, mosquitoes will be infected with Wolbachia and will be resistant. It is interesting because it targets only one species of mosquito. So you are not like you do with insecticides, uh, targeting a complete ecosystem. You are just uh, only focusing on one type of mosquito, which we know is harmful to humans. And also, it's something that already exists in nature. You have to realize that probably 20% of insects are naturally infected with Wolbachia. So it's not like you're breaking something that is not existing already in, in nature. And when you look at the impact of the trials that have tried to evaluate the efficacy of such methods, here in Indonesia, they did a randomized trial uh, where some areas uh, got Wolbachia-infected mosquito released and others were serving as control areas. And as you can see here, you have clearly uh, a rapid um, occupation of the intervention areas by those mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia close to 100%. You even have a contamination after some time of the control areas by Wolbachia uh, infected mosquitoes because of this transmissibility factor. But the impact of the intervention in the cumulative risk of dengue is high. Here you have the control areas and here you have the intervention areas and the efficacy of the intervention has been estimated at 77%. It will be interesting to see the long-term result and sustainability of the release of those mosquitoes uh, in, in the population. What about the unknown threats? Um, we had 20 years of very large excitement because of introduction of high throughput sequencing that allowed discovery of many new viruses. And we are talking about probably a few hundred thousands of viruses. But what do we do with all that? And simply the analysis of the phylogenetic sequences of all those viruses is absolutely huge. Here there have been some improvement in algorithm uh, trying to go around the classical assembly methods which are extremely tedious, uh, which were published here, which goes about 10 to 100 times faster. But you have also new techniques um, around ultra high throughput sequence alignment um, at huge scale that allowed to very rapidly uh, discover, for instance, more than 100,000 novel RNA viruses based on their RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And that was including also nine uh, new uh, novel corona, uh, coronaviruses. Um, however, you can't um, do much out of these tens or hundreds of thousands of viruses. You have to try to have a screening uh, approach to realize which ones are going to be harmful to humans if you want to, to, to mitigate the risk of pandemics. And here, uh, there are some different steps that, with systems that allows you to try to identify, for instance, which of those viruses, uh, which type of receptor do those viruses use and therefore would be able to uh, uh, find at the surface of human cells to enter the cell. You can also try to screen how well those viruses will multiply in cells. You can see what the innate immunity could be doing to counter them. And you could see also how they would already be present in some of the population in contact with different type of animal harboring those viruses. So all those steps could be implemented in safe ways in order to screen in these hundreds of thousands of viruses um, but starting by those that we know uh, could be related, for instance, to, to the bats that I was uh, already, uh, I mean, pointing at as transmitter viruses pathological to humans, to try to find out and, and, and really uh, corner down those viruses that could be uh, dangerous for us. I will end by saying that, unfortunately, uh, there will be new pandemics, um, and we have to be ready for it. And when we look at um, how capable we have been in the past to predict new pandemics. Um, unfortunately, we didn't do a very good job. I mean, many uh, took place or were identified first in places where they were not expected. Um, I'm talking about Mexican flu, for instance, with a name that has been removed since because countries don't like to be associated with the disease. But just to say that the uh, H1N1 pandemic started in Mexico and not in Asia, as we usually believe they would come out. Zika was 
really noticed first in French Polynesia in 2013. Um, and, and we have had uh, MERS coming in the Gulf countries, you know, uh, nobody would have anticipated that from what we know about bats and beta coronaviruses. So we need to have a system that allows us to be uh, capable of reacting to those emergences that we can't predict where they would be. And it brings together the capacity of the detection of being able to screen the animal population around to find out where the reservoirs are to prevent reintroduction, and to be able to build transmission chains and then to bring mathematical modeling into uh, um, trying to predict the spread of, of that new agent. So all those things have to be put in place. We need also to have some vaccines that are ready to be used, and this is one initiative carried by a group called CEPI, which is making public and private partnerships, where for a list of viruses that are well known, uh, they bring vaccines to development of stage twos, which means that the preclinical studies have been done, they have been shown to be safe in humans, they have been shown to be immunogenic in humans, and when the pandemic starts, you just go to the phase three to see whether they are truly effective. This is what happened, for instance, with the Zebov vaccine, uh, which was brought to the shelves by a Canadian group, and during the 2013-2014 epidemic in West Africa, could be uh, tried in phase three trial uh, in West Africa and shown to be effective. And we need to have that exercise with those viruses that are candidate for pandemic. And I will finish by mentioning again that uh, it remains incredibly important in all that to continue to invest in basic research, because if you take the example of COVID-19 with which I started, you know, if we had a vaccine in less than a year, which allowed us to move out of these uh, cycles of uh, lockdowns, curfews, and other restriction of population uh, movements, it's because mRNA first had been discovered about 60 years ago, there had been some research on it, there had been close to 20 years of research on beta coronavirus since, since the SARS pandemic in 2003, and there had been 15 years research of mRNA vaccine. And when you look at the timeline to the right here, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 was released on the 10th of January. One day later, because of the past work, um, people of Moderna were able to add two protein mutations in the S protein to stabilize the protein itself. And five days later, only, they were able to send, um, encapsulate in uh, lipo nanoparticles those vaccines for GMP production, so that in March 2020, two months later, the vaccine could go into human trial. And that would not have been possible if there had not been all that work in basic science prior to the uh, emergence of this virus for a vaccine to be ready. So we need also to continue to work on those viruses, those that represent the major threats, um, because we unfortunately we will eventually need one day to move very fast into drugs and vaccines. Thank you very much.